the very yeah, yeah, spot. No, I um, out. Yeah, I just want to create a product that. Uh, The first three are going to be uh, done by one group, and then the last three, so the first four questions, one, one A, two, and uh, three, and then four, five, and five A will be done by a different group. And we are going to cover this in principle. It also deals with a key question that was asked by email by a couple of people. When we say, what, you know, I mean, is there anything from the last lecture, maybe it was a very specific question, but more broadly, what I mean by what is their best plan going forward? I mean, to touch on some of these things. So we're gonna cover uh, marketing, we're gonna cover expats, which I think is a really important topic. Uh, so I would suggest it is important, it's required almost in, in, you know, to at least make a comment about definitely expatriate levels, what you think their role will be in, in your case, uh, as well as what do you think the marketing uh, should be? Um, you know, clearly the make or buy or physical distribution questions are much less, uh, you know, um, impertinent. Uh, and so, you know, I agree that that would be a very lightly covered, you know, uh, unless you have something very specific to say, you don't need to, please me, I'm not looking for you to comment on distribution when it's a services business, uh, you know, to the extent um, it doesn't need to be said. So these are the questions for the end. And why I'm showing you now is if you jot them down or screenshot it, as we go through it, you'll be able to kind of prepare, uh, then we will have a little break. Uh, so you can just touch up the notes, um, splitting this into two groups and hopefully that would be uh, a, a kind of really neat way of getting through all the material plus doing this. All right, so on to the, the, the content. So firstly, a quick review uh, and just Really, there were, there were two big topics um, you know, that were kind of notable. One was this bulwark effect, and, and we tried to play the bulwark game, um, which 
which you know on a Zoom call, uh, you know, proved more sort of technically challenging than expected. Nonetheless, we made the comment that what what actually happens here, uh, as as some people experienced, is when there is a, a variance in the demand. So I said it's about 100 is your units in stock, and if you recall, I did 100 with an Excel randomizer to give me up to 200 or up down to zero, some sort of demand. Whenever the retailer sees a little bit too much demand, what they tend to do is they say to the distributor, I need a bit more stock. But if this is plus 20, so 120, so it's over by 20, then they might say to the distributor, please order 140 units for me. And the distributor sees this and they say, well, please order 160 units for me. And by the time you get to a supplier, you're at, please order 200. And in fact, uh, you know, one of the groups had eventually an order of uh, over just 10 rounds of, of several hundred going up and down. And that's kind of the key challenge that we, we mentioned on the bulwark. And we said that, you know, what fixes this or what avoids it is better information flow up and down the chain, because then everybody would be able to moderate their volumes and you don't have this kind of escalation. And then we spoke about make or buy. And we said that when you make it, when you're fully integrated, you get um, better quality and lower costs. You know, it can be done. Uh, specialized investments because effectively you take on all the risk. Um, and, and so a supplier isn't kind of hedging their bets. Uh, you obviously protect your proprietary technology really well and your scheduling and integration can be perfect. Um, and, you know, and on the, the reverse side, it is a less flexible system it can lead to poor levels of competition and inefficiency uh, and low levels of specialization. So you can be subscale in pieces of your business. So when you produce a Boeing aer aer airplane, uh, you might not be scale for producing landing gear, although you are scale for producing aircraft. So, so this was just a key, uh, again, perhaps not particularly relevant for, for your case. This is gonna be pretty, pretty relevant. Uh, just as a, a very overview, and, and not this slide in particular, but I'd suggest whenever you move into a market, the volume, uh, getting some pricing information is important. So 20th percentile, what's the median average price, 80th percentile price point. Um, you, you know, some of the things we saw with Persia, India is extremely low price pointing. Uh, in fact, produce a new vehicle. Uh, you see that also with Renault producers some vehicles there, very, very low price points. Uh, so it's quite important that these numbers are, are clear. We, we had a bit of a debate in the class about oh, could the ambassador brand be used? And, uh, you know, I mean, I, I suppose only time will tell. But the reality is uh, there were good arguments presented for or against. You know, you can use an electric vehicles that might be just 1% of the market. It's a big market, so maybe that's okay. But, but it is important to have a look at this. You know, other groups saying uh, better effort could be in, in two wheelers because that's where there's a lot of volume. Um, what are the top five brands? Because their distribution, their network size, how much they localize is likely to give you really good insights into what the market is looking for. Uh, it, it would be you know, a little unusual if you say, uh, for example, we sell cars, we sell Persia, we're going to embark on a completely novel strategy that nobody else has tried. Uh, typically, you don't make money. And unless you're Tesla, you usually don't get rewarded by the stock market. So, I mean, there's always an anomaly. But you know, typically people want you to produce some returns. Uh, and what is your brand share and average price point? Because, uh, you know, if you know what the average brands and their price points are, it's a little more granular. So, uh, you know, I think that when whenever there's a market demand analysis, it's important. And, and, you know, really what the slide says is how big is your market? What price are you going to sell it? What are your competitors doing? If you knew nothing else and you got these three questions right, you probably wouldn't make a complete hash of, of an entry decision. Okay, so just in class, what are the seven P's of marketing? Product, the price. Um, Place. Yeah, Position. Uh, yeah, I think people um, process. Sorry? People process. Yes, people process. Peer, peer. I think we have what else? <laughs> Promotion. Oh yeah, yeah. Promotion is a good one. And last one. Physical evidence. Okay, cool. So, 
So we've got the four Ps, this is where it started. Uh, and we've got that um, idea of placement uh, or, or position. Uh, I think Monica, if you meant it in the physical sense, so what are you selling your stuff for? Uh, what is it? How are you promoting it? And where are you trying to sell it through? We're gonna delve into some of these a little more detail. And then the next three are much more orientated around service industries, which should ring a bell about um, Morphia. So physical evidence, which is, can you sell a Chanel bag for 10,000 US dollars uh, in, in a, a supermarket with next to groceries. You know, so, so there's some obvious sort of things that you go, there's physical evidence that helps to cons convince the consumer that it's a rational decision to pay exorbitant amounts of money uh, for, some, for some products. Uh, and then obviously for services, if you are offering um, a high-end accounting service uh, you know, legal service, you tend to, you know, be on the 10th floor of some multi-story overlooking the bay. Uh, and and this, this provides some sort of tangibility to, to a service. So, so the next three are much more heavily focused in terms of services and, and, and should be considered. Um, the first four were, were, were much more product oriented. They still apply to services, but, but what I'm saying is the weight. Last three, very service oriented, a bit product, first for very product and a bit service. Uh, so obviously process is just how does the actual value get delivered? Is that efficient? Is it neat? Is the customer experience good? Uh, and people, um, which is actually who are my people and how do I select them so that I am monitoring their customer interface at all times? So, uh, you know, uh, one of the things we're going to talk in just a second about is consistency. Uh, and that, that's quite important here. Is that where customer segmentation comes in, Nicholas? Uh, under people or? Yes. No, I would say customer segmentation is something that um, you probably do. I would suggest first it's defining an archetypal customer. Uh, so this is very, very practical. But yep. so first you would go, I've got three or four different types of customer. What do they look like? Just so that you can help anchor the discussion. So yep. one customer, for example, is um, in, in the pharmaceuticals world, you'll go, I have a 70 year old male who has multiple conditions, including high blood pressure and, and type two diabetes. Yeah. Uh, they have polypharmacy, they're on 20 different drugs. Yeah. My next consumer is, uh, is, uh, yeah, is uh, a family for their young child where it's colds and flu. So the point is you create some consumers and then those consumers, uh, you can customize the seven Ps for them Okay. To some extent. Now, clearly, you can't have completely different P's for all of it, but it gives you a sense of um, maybe the product is different for them. So, with pharmaceuticals, a little more challenging, but for motor vehicles, you know, the product is different for, for a 20 year old versus a yeah. midlife person versus a retiree. Um, but your dealership, your physical evidence is always the same. So, these, you can't simply go, well, all seven P's get customized because uh, some of them are brand issues, physical evidence, process, people, I would suggest are, are brands, um, whereas price, product, uh, promotion is, is, is quite more product oriented and placement depends on your distribution channel. Yeah. So let's just think about that. Like if we said uh, Chanel or, you know, Gucci or YSL or something like that, I would argue that your physical evidence, your store, which is on... Um, you know, on, on the main street uh, is, is going to be consistent. The physical evidence on my purchase, the process, the kind of handholding, the high levels of customer service, the way my people are dressed, who I'm hiring, that's going to be consistent, even though my product range may be from $1,000 to $100,000. Okay. Um, you know, um, yeah. and I think that, that those three tend to be brand clustered. So back to your question, or just to summarize, when you segment a market, you're going, what are my typical, what do my different customers look like? And what product or service do they want to buy? At what price point with what features and specifications and how do I promote to them? Um, when it comes to the physical evidence process and people, often it can't be disentangled from your brand uh, because yeah, it's difficult to replicate them every time. They have a different physical evidence. In fact, I would suggest it's, it's theoretically almost impossible and, and probably quite damaging. Thank you. 
So I'm going to, let's not break out just so that we can make sure we, we, we've got sufficient time. Um, and so some of these I would suggest are more sensitive to cage distance. Um, and so let's, uh, I'm just going to ask a few questions just for some call outs. Um, price, what, what is price most sensitive to, you know? Uh, the economic distance. Um, yeah, I'd suggest the bigger economic distance, the more likely price. We just saw Peugeot US, where we argued that US customers may be tolerant of higher product specs, lower, um, you know, higher pricing and vice versa for India. So price and product. Um, product, what's, uh, what's, what's a kind of key one for product? Cultural? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, so your use cases for beer, are going to be are going to be sensitive to this. Your vehicle specifications are going to be sensitive to this. Clearly, if you're if you're producing uh, uh, music or something, that's very sensitive. Um, if we look at uh, uh, make perhaps uh, physical evidence is going to be what. It's going to be around geographic. Maybe look. I think physical evidence is more about uh, think of it as your store fit out, your shop front fit out. I say shop front in a broad way. Not only is it the Chanel shop, how does it look, what quality tiles, what do we do? But it could be if you're KPMG, what do our offices need to look like? Um, so that is- Oh, it's culture? Place. Yeah, absolutely. So I think that that's again, likely to be culture, also likely to be economics. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if, if you're gonna charge a huge number, then your store needs to look a particular way. And if you are attracting mass market, that same thing is going to be difficult or difficult to monetize. And so you end up with something, this is not definitive, but something that looks like cultural is important, less so for price, but it is important for promotions, products, um, uh, placement. Uh, I, I once, uh, you, I mean, we had in the auto world, you know, they often bring you together like annually to share experiences across countries. And there are some really specific things that are inappropriately presented. So uh, we once had a talk by Tunisia on how to sell more trucks that involved following the camel trains, uh, you know, and setting up tents in the desert, you know, just completely irrelevant for 99.9% .9 of other countries. Just, you know, <laughs> uh, you know there's, there's a real, real difference there. Um, you know, processes, as we said, administrative in banking and healthcare is an important cage distance. And so process, physical evidence and people may be affected in all three if you're in a highly, admin, uh, highly regulated environment. What are you allowed to do? What are the requirements? This is, these are the kinds of questions you would be facing if you were internationalizing or fear. You go, okay, am I just allowed to do what I want with people? Yeah. All right, communication channels. So you clearly have direct selling uh, sales promotion, direct marketing, and advertising, which is of many different types. Uh, and so a communication strategy, we're going to touch back on this when we come to push versus pull strategies. Uh, but just, just to have that vocabulary kind of there, um, you, you know, what direct sales, sales promotion. Advertising is really reaching out to customers where they are outside of a sales moment. Uh, that's kind of more pure marketing. Direct marketing is marketing material, but it's far more targeted. And then sales promotion and direct selling would be at the at the moment of truth, they call it. You know, how do you affect the decision making? So that's much more sales oriented. Um, we, we don't have time. This is not a marketing course to, to go through this. I'm more than happy if you email me a question. It's, Okay, um, I, I included this and I included the reading because I think that at any level, when you, if you are overseeing an internationalization strategy, uh, it's important to kind of make a decision about your product or service. And, and uh, Percy and Rossiter uh, have this kind of very um, useful and, and theoretically and um, academically valid uh, model. So they say there's two types of products broadly, informational, which is that the buying motivation is some sort of negative problem removal and transformation where it's a really positive emotion. Now, you know, it's not meant to kind of twist your mind around uh, what 
what exactly fits into each category. Um, and But it is important to kind of just think of a product as, am I selling it as something that's going to really up and change your life? Or am I selling it as something that will uh, deal with challenges that you have? Because you've got things like Sandy Putzmeister uh, that we're going to cover later. And so you want to think about what, what sort of product is, is their equipment? Just broadly, where does it fit into this category? And then you've got high involvement and low involvement. And effectively, uh, that's a, a dimension around, uh, you know, how much risk is there involved in each purchase? And the importance here is simply about how do you approach the market? What is your messaging? Uh, what does your advertising look like? Uh, and so you don't need to know enormous amounts about an industry or a product, but categorizing it here will allow you to always ask the right questions and oversee a marketing effort. Uh, and, and, and that's that's my goal here is that, uh, you, you know, the, you can say, hey, I, I believe that our product is this and I need to see the following in the marketing plan. Do, did we deal with it or not? If you didn't deal with it, then uh, th this is a valid sort of model. All right, so what we've got from that, and as you can see, you've got this kind of two by two. So you've got this informational transformational dimension and you've got a low involvement, high involvement dimension. Uh, and you know what, what, what that is about is just about being aware of your product and what it needs. And you just need to note what is the correct emotional appeal uh, and what and have I made adequate logical support for the two. So um, or fear, what, what is that? Give some comments with some justification. I'm not going to write this down so you can change your mind, but it's useful to consider what, what is the nursing business? And, and that, why I think it's a good discussion here is it, one, it doesn't matter if you give an incorrect answer now, as long as you think about your answer. Uh, and two is the point is this model can be applied to any product. Um, mm. Okay, well, let me, let me give a prompt a question. Deal with them separately. Do you believe that placing your elderly, presumably loved one, but let's, let's not stretch it, uh, somebody who's old that you're you know, making a decision like this on behalf of, is uh, low involvement? In other words, uh, you know, try and, and if it works out, cool. And if it doesn't work out, well, no problem, you'll move on. Or is it going to be high involvement? In other words, it's a decision that, you know, is quite important you would ask for quite a lot of research to get right first time. Yeah. I think I would go with high involvement. Yeah. Anybody yeah. dissent? No, I mean, I tend to agree, right? I think that, uh, you know, this is a type of thing which tends to be higher involvement, there's no doubt. Yeah. Um, and then out of these, so, so, so we've, now, we've now kind of gone, great, that's, that's our zone, great. Uh, and this, there might be more nuances. You may end up with a bit in each, but uh, what's the thought? Is it negative drive reduction or positive drive enhancement? See, I was just going, uh, kind of just to throw in the middle there somehow, because I feel like, yes, it's, it's, a, it's informational in terms of there's an issue, possibly some problems to be solved. We need, we need the housing. We might need the care facilities to support certain medical conditions. But at the same time, the, I don't know, like uh, there's, there's a certain drive of positivity for enhancement as well in certain brands, depending on the kind of care home you might place somebody in. Because I think care homes go from, from a varying a premium to, to low income kind of options. Uh -huh. Yep. Any other comments? I think it's more the information to me. It will be more transformation of the lifestyle change. All right, so you're going maybe more here. Mm. Yeah, so look, I, I mean, I, I tend to agree. Um, you know, Paul says, well, there's a different, there's different segments in this market. So if you were quite low end, um, you know, just cost, I mean, there are old people who don't didn't end up with great retirement packages, right? So this is not a, not a negative statement about them. 
but arguably they might be looking for safety, reliability, and, and simply an ability to, um, uh, to get by. Uh, and, and so you would suggest that that brand may sit um, right, right there in, in informational. On the other hand, you could retire to Mar-a-Lago, which, which is where Donald Trump is. And for some people, that's transformational, right? They go, well, it's, it's you know, I mean, it's a very different perspective. You know, what am I going to get out of this? Because clearly I have enough money to worry about those, those other things. And this would apply to, if you're selling Mercedes-Benz, you tend to be more over here. And if you're selling, um, you know, entry-level vehicles, tend to be more on informational. Uh, one of the key things to note is if a product has a reasonable transformational element, it's important to not ignore it. Um, you know, you won't see, and, and all of you have consumed television, um, I'm sure before the internet, and uh, you wouldn't have seen any car adverts which completely avoided the transformational element. And so I would suggest it's exactly the same when you're talking about uh, old age homes in that even if you're selling an entry level product, um, you know, people want to have that feeling that there's some positive element to it. So, so I, I would, I would agree, you know, again, that, that it's always going to have an, an aspect of, but yeah, this is the kind of, this is what the model is used for. And it's part of your question for Sani and Putzmeister. So, you know, this is quite, uh, but it, it sort of helps with an idea of how do I market to these people? What do I need to put in the messaging to them? If you have a high involvement product, people are going to look for information. Uh, so it's not a point of sale purchase. It's going to be deeply considered, uh, you know, and, and there's going to be more contact time required in your sale. How you deal with that um, is, is tactical. We come on to this idea of brand knowledge. Okay, so, so now we've said that products can fit into types and that type drives how we advertise. It also drives how we sell. Um, and, and, and what we're trying to do is build brand equity through our advertising strategy. And that has really this component of brand awareness. And awareness has got one of two types. Again, you classify a product. It's important that you think of a product as having either a high recognition requirement or a high recall requirement. Um, and, and, and I'd suggest you should be quite disciplined in not imagining that every product requires both uh, because it's, it's a little bit sloppy to think that. Um, and it, it certainly doesn't force you to really consider the, the fundamental sales process. So let's just give, I'd like some examples, please. Um, I gave one in the curator for me, like recall is like a, a lunchtime F and B system. Like I'm thinking about what I might like in that moment and recalling the kind of product or brand I want to engage with. That's right. So give us some examples of a recall product. Uh, so it could be uh, on a bad day, it's a fast food choice. So McDonald's or Subway or KFC. Okay. Um, I'm going to just call out some names so that we, we press on. Ji Young, just because you're next in the, my picture. Yeah, so for recall recall or recognition, just pick, pick one. Um, yeah, recall product. Uh, so, like the, when we look at a high apparel, high apparel brand, uh, yeah. so for example, like the Gucci, Gucci uh, launched. A new, uh, I mean, kind of a recall, uh, recall model, which yep. is a Jackie. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so, so, I mean, yeah. oh, I agree with that. Cool. May? What about those uh, car recall? Car, car recall? <laughs> so, I'm not talking about recall campaigns. I'm talking about a dimension of how does the consumer purchase your product? So, I would agree that cars are definitely a recall style product. Um, but I just, I'm not sure. I, I just wanted to draw a distinction. I'm not talking about car recalls. That's, that's a procedural thing. So um, I'm going to take May as being cars, right? Is recognition, um, obviously, like it's the, it's like the um, customers will obviously recognize the logo. So they'll know, like Paul, I know you spoke about recall to McDonald's, but you just see the M and you know it's McDonald's. So it's familiarity of logos. That's right. Yeah, so like give, me, your... give me a product, Monica. Um, let's do, I was going to just go, well, it's a car, Mercedes. <laughs> okay. So, I mean, I think that actually that's going to be a recall type of product. Okay. 
What about um, uh, tomato, tom Heinz tomato sauce? Heinz tomato sauce, yeah. Pepsi. Heinz, great, happy with that. Um, Sanjay? Um, you know, not that I use it, but head and shoulders shampoo. Is that a yeah, recognition? Cool. Uh, right, yeah. All right, so let me, me let's me just talk I about these. Can. I'm sorry? Uh, can I ask for the brand equity? Can it apply for surface brand like Tony and Guy? Yeah, of course, of course. Yeah, their product is like surface. It's kind of like the product. Yeah, yeah, I understand. Um, okay. Yeah, so I would put, uh, you know, and, and this is, I'm really, let's talk about that because that's that's a really nice, nice problematic one. Uh, when I say problematic, it's one of those ones that kind of pushes the boundary of, of each. So, of course, everybody says that their stated requirement is that people remember their brand. But uh, I assure you that having done that as a, as a pure profession or with, with large scale budgets, it's very, very challenging to be in top, a top of mind recall position. Very, very difficult. And the, the this quantities you're going to spend are staggering. And so really the fundamental difference you're looking for is when I come to a category need moment. Uh, so Paul, I, I, I'm going to disagree a little with you on fast food. It's unlikely that you go, oh, I'm hungry, but not impossible. And then you'll drive 40 minutes for a McDonald's. It's quite likely you drive down the road and you go, hey, I'm feeling a bit hungry. There's McDonald's. Cool. Do I make a purchase decision now or not? So that recognition is strong, but of course they spend absolutely huge amounts of money on making you remember their brand because um, it does differentiate them, allow them to charge product. And if you're sitting at home, you, you know, you're not gonna order Uber Eats from randomburgers.com uh, if, if, if that's gonna be a thing, you might walk down to a McDonald's because it's available. So, so the, the technical marketing thing is their brand is available for you. So when you're searching, um, it's, it's there. But fast food is right on the edge. Um, head and shoulders, uh, you know, that sort of heights. You're walking down the aisles and those brands spend a lot of money so that simply as you're walking down, you see it, you go, hey, do I need tomato sauce? So the fact that the product is there triggers the check, the, in, the mental check about uh, do I need this? Whereas a car purchase tends to be quite a large considered decision and therefore brand recall is much more important. You're not in a shop walking down, oh my goodness, I need a car. It's, it's a thing, I, I go and search, you know, I search through my mind, what brands am I interested in? I then do research, et cetera, et cetera. So you're not looking for a trigger. Maybe the, the archetype of recognition is the sweet cue in front of a checkout. That's pure recognition, right? You walk down there, you see a chocolate, you buy it. You didn't think you needed a chocolate 10 minutes ago. You probably didn't need it then. But the fact that you see something, there's some sort of trigger, I like the brand, I buy. Um, but, but you're not pushing people to, to say, uh, please name five chocolates, it's, you know, which is which more, sort of more of a recall test. So Tony and Guy is, again, one of those categories, but like McDonald's, where you go, if you're walking through a, a shopping center, uh, you see a hairdresser, the placement is really important, and that may trigger you to purchase the product whether it's Tony or Guy or not. But when you get to a big brand like a McDonald's or a Tony and Guy, you may say, actually, I look for those. Um, so, you know, if you took a thousand people, there's there's a small number who are recall producting, you know, hair, haircuts. Um, you know, guys like Sanjay would probably walk into anybody who had a barber pole, right? I mean, that's... Um, I got one. Have, How about Panadol? Yeah, so again, you've got this idea of uh, probably, you know, if you walk into a, a pharmacy, you're going to go, uh, great, I just want to recognize the name Panadol, because the, the kind of, um, you, you know, the, the kind of use case is when you're in a pharmacy, you want to see a number of brands and you're going to pick one. So uh, you're right that you can remember the name, like we're talking about these very big brands. But over-the-counter medicines typically are recognition. Uh, I'm just, uh, you know, I'm saying we can think of very big brands, but that kind of underplays the evidence because sometimes, you know, if you don't represent Panadol, but you have paracetamol, I'd suggest you're just aiming for recognition. Person walks in, they need Panadol. The pharmacist says, do you want Panadol? I've got something 50% of the price. You're like, I'm happy. I would suggest over-the-counter is recognition in general. But the next thing is brand image. So I'm, I'm, I'm just stepping these out because these words kind of get thrown around. They sometimes can blend with each other and 
and you don't need an essay on each one, but they're just a criteria. Okay, so you've got brand image, which is the associations. How strong are they? Uh, how favorable are they? And how unique are they? And those are the three dimensions uh, of a brand image. So is Nike, um, you know, is it strongly associated with Serena Williams? Are you quite happy with that? As well as their, let's say, their reasonable association or close association with the woke movement? And how unique is all of this in your mind? Uh, and so a big part, as you know, of the advertising campaigns is driving uniqueness and favorability uh, and strength, but um, you know, they're, they're kind of slightly different dimensions. And so when you're thinking about a brand, uh, you know, just these three items are, are the three items, uh, you know, you can unpack it in, in a lot. And then the brand attitude is your brand image plus context. So I may have a brand image, um, and then, uh, you know, it, my, my attitude can change depending on the context. Um, so, <clears throat> you, you know, like McDonald's, my, my brand image may have some associations, favorable, unfavorable, unique or not. Uh, you put me in a context like um, it's three o'clock in the morning and, you know, I haven't gone home yet. And it becomes much, my brand attitude becomes far more favorable than, than you know, 20 minutes before a gym class where arguably those associations are quite differently weighted. Okay, so one of the things that I have asked specifically is the four C's of a brand position. And, and what I mean by brand position is the marketing uh, product positioning statement, not physical location. And this is kind of like your brand promise. It doesn't need to be your brand promise, but it should be the thing that underpins all of your decisions. And you need to be clear what you're gonna do. Uh, you need to be consistent that your promise is what you actually do. Uh, you need to be credible and you need to be competitive. In other words, uh, differentiated. Um, is it, am I different enough? Am I good enough? And this is a, a, a sort of four C's marketing, you know, love the, the P's and the C's and the, that's just part of, part of the industry. Uh, but yeah, this is a neat model. And so when you think about a brand or fear or Sany, you really want to say, if I had a sentence, I would want to cover off these four C's or two sentences so that I can really distill what I'm doing because this avoids a lot of the messes that you see in, in, in product marketing. If you just have these four ideas in mind, you know, am I clear? Am I consistent? In other words, if I'm going to advertise top end, my physical evidence needs to be top end. That's consistency. My service needs to be top end. If I'm going to, you know, it's, it's not, um, am I credible? In other words, do people believe I can deliver this? Uh, and yeah, am I different? That's kind of a competitive message. And that brings us to the close of marketing. And, you know, you do have a, a course on this, but I think that, that if you just touch on these items, you'll have a good map to, to drive a marketing outcome from whoever actually does marketing uh, for you. Uh, or at least to, to interrogate a marketing outcome. All right. <clears throat> distribution. The main uh, distribution systems are the retail concentration, channel length, channel exclusivity, and channel quality. So these are kind of four dimensions. Um, And so, um, you know, the difference between countries is retail concentration is sometimes very concentrated uh, and uh, other countries it can be highly fragmented. Uh, so retail concentration in Japan tends to be very, very concentrated in the United States, very, very fragmented. Uh, channel length, obviously this is how many intermediaries are between um, the producer and the consumer. So direct sales tends to be short, um, but there are things, uh, recognition goods, the chocolate bar has gone through a very long channel from the producer to a distributor to an importer and, and so on. Uh, channel exclusivity, uh, again, just a concept of if you allow a lot of things sold through the same channel or not, and then channel quality is really about, you know, the, the, how specific is the channel for your product. So you've now got the four terms in mind, right? And we haven't spent a lot of time because I think you can kind of imagine what they mean, channel length, channel exclusivity, channel quality. <clears throat> um, 
And here's an example of how channel strategies, uh, with the missing E, but channel strategy changes over time for an industry. It's important to recognize that it is in, it's key. So right at the beginning, Apple was sold through, um, you know, very boutique uh, for hobbyists and professionals. Um, but then IBM, you know, it became a direct sales thing through specialty stores, which is a little less exclusive than a boutique, um, you know, and, and has a longer supply chain. Uh, you've got the IBM Compaq merger, and you now start having value added resellers and superstores. And by the time you, you know, nowadays, you, you know, it's in electronic stores, you can buy them direct, you can get them from superstores, because the customer segment has become more and more and more broad. So a narrow customer segment will allow you to have a narrower uh, distribution. Uh, and when you have very broad customer segments, you're going to have a very broad distribution. So, uh, you know, I think that this, um, you know, I think this sort of uh, makes, makes sort of intuitive sense. And there's really four questions you're going to ask yourself. My customers, uh, how important are the P's? Uh, and my, my competitors, how do they, how have they solved this problem? So when we say that, what we're saying is, imagine if you're introducing a product to a new market and you need to decide on how do you introduce it? Are you selling it through um, all the stores or not? And, and some of you may have those products. Um, you know, if you're introducing a, a food stuff, it looks very, very different to if you're trying to sell Sany product, clearly your distribution strategy is gonna be completely different because your customers are gonna be different and uh, the competitors behavior is different. And then obviously your channel, it's channel capability and cost. So uh, who's gonna hold the inventory, process warranties, uh, service my customers, and obviously who's got the power in the channel. So sometimes it's really useful to provide your product to an outsourced sales channel, um, but the key thing to note is that uh, they can end up being the boss of that, that relationship. And so you've got this kind of high control channels um, versus uh, sort of arm's length channels. So high control, you know, means that you might own a, a big part of uh, that sales channel. And effectively, your product is a high proportion of the final sales. So exclusivity as a dimension is high, right? Length is probably low, uh, but you have lower controls or arm's length where you typically are a lower proportion of the end product. So if you sell any sort of FMCG, uh, you're going to be a low proportion of the final product. <clears throat> but you're also going to have low control. Now, does that matter? Well, it's very dependent on your brand size. Uh, so if you're McDonald's, you are big enough to insist on high control. Uh, you are entirely, but, but you, know, you pay the bills, so that works out for you. Uh, whereas if you were a niche product, uh, let's say the Incredible Meat Company, which is that a business in the United States that sells plant-based meat replacement products. Uh, there's just no way you're going to have uh, your self-owned or a branded uh, channel. You, you don't have the reach or, or anything like that. So you're going to be in uh, in this dimension. Uh, so you know it's quite important to figure out: can I actually pay for a high-control uh, system? Now, in a high control system, what you can do is you can manage physical evidence, you can manage your people, you can do all of that stuff because you own everything. Uh, and so this is why your super exclusive brands uh, tend to have their own stores, it's high control, uh, they have to charge a lot because their volumes are lower, but then they're able to manage their people and processes. Um, and, and that's why that is a barrier to entry for them because you, know, you, you simply can't set up a channel like that um, unless you're willing to. Uh, spend a lot on it. All right, so we asked the question push versus pull, and here's some comments on what's called push versus pull. Now, this is, I, I suppose, a very neat, uh, simple model for, for distribution channels and sales efforts, but it's not, uh, you know, it's not as nuanced as, as the other market in questions. So, if, you know, the argument here is that firms fundamentally choose between push and pull strategy. And as I said, it's somewhat a summation between, uh, you know, several different dimensions of selling, advertising, uh, and distribution, but, but it's, they're, they're not, they're, they're neat headings. So they obviously depend on quite a few things uh, from uh, channel length, uh, media availability, media consumption, the product type, the complexity, 
Um, so push strategies are more common where you have industrial products or complex new products where your distribution channels are so short and where the availability of, of media, broadcast media to reach a large number of people is low. And pull strategies are more common in consumer goods where distribution channels are long and sufficient print and electronic media are available to, to carry the message. So, you know, I mean, this is a, a, an insight into how much advertising and what style of advertising is going to be required. Because when you look at a product like Sunny and Putzmeister, uh, you have a very different perspective of what they'll be doing uh, than if you look at uh, perhaps a product like Coca-Cola uh, or beer. So we've got, we've got some examples coming in a second. So here's, here's an idea of, uh, of what Dell does. Um, you know, they've got a very short cycle. Uh, so, the, you know, I mean, the procurement through to the manufacturing uh, and then detergent, as I said, FMCG tends to have this huge, um, you know, huge sort of complexity, a lot of layers. Uh, and so that's called push. It's not simply the length of that channel though that defines whether or not you pull or push. It's, it's a, uh, the question is about how does the sale happen? Uh, and with that comes common, you know, common patterns, but they're not necessarily purely exclusive. So we're actually gonna do a breakout here um, and we're gonna spend um, just five minutes. If you could just decide push or pull for each one of these and uh, one sentence uh, reasoning. Uh, and I'm gonna break uh, into two groups, is that gonna is that gonna work? Two groups, cool. We lost Nicholas. Oh, we can have a break now. <laughs> oh, yours, Paul, run the glass, mate. Oh, me, he's not here. Yay. Oh. It's break oh, time. Yeah. Yeah. He I was talking to himself. myself and I was sitting in cheese, you know, it's, uh, it's unusually quiet. Okay, cool. So, um, how are we going to let's get some ideas? Side of ending machines. Ooh. Paul. Uh, nah, I'd go push. Push, push, push. All right, I, you know, I, I'm going to go on the side of, uh, of push here. I think the distribution strength is very important. Um, and so the more places it's available, you kind of have a point of sale requirement. I'm thirsty. I see a soda vending machine. I, I get it. The consumer pull of this is, I would suggest, reasonably low for any given soda vending machine. Uh, I think so. Uh, I would I would argue you know I'd support push on that. So Amazon.com. Paul. We went with Paul as well. Yeah, I, I tend to agree. Right. I mean, you've got a number of choices on the internet. The consumer decides uh, to go through pull. And what does that mean? It means that Amazon will spend a lot in making sure that you recall their brand because when it comes to a moment that you want to buy something you you have a set in your mind and they've got to be on that list otherwise you'll go somewhere else fully emergency care or should we put sorry uh push in our team so we defined emergency care as i guess a very specific niche as like using an ambulance and i guess you don't want to have to <laughs> know an ambulance exists to be able to use it you should be able to just call and sort of know it exists and provide that service so we went with pool for emergency care yeah it's an interesting example isn't it uh, you know emergency care so um you know I, I think it's it's got those dimensions of going well perhaps the sales process here in non-united states 
is going to be, as you're saying, kind of a recognition, I have a need. And therefore, I just want to, you know, I have a very short list of things on my mind, but I'm not making a long thing. So I, I would tend to put emergency care in most countries uh, under a more of a, a push type of recognition uh, system, but I understand the, the challenge here. From a sales perspective, it is part of your recall list. It's not like necessarily in your face that I'm pushing a sale onto you. Um, I suppose what, what this maybe highlights is if I said uh, cardiac surgery, we would probably agree that's going to be, you know, something like pull. You're going to have a lot of recall requirement in that. Um, uh, you know, but uh, probably emergency care, I'd suggest if, you know, you know, that has a short channel, that's going to be a push type of problem. All right, paint industry. Push. push. Yeah, probably a shortish channel. You're going to be somewhere you need paint. It's either on the shelf and you buy it or it's not. Uh, so it's, it's unlikely to be uh, very deeply considered. Uh, runway capacity in airport, just a crazy example, I suppose, to illustrate the point. And again, you know, this is, uh, you know, kind of if it's there, it's there. You're, you're probably going to be pushed there. Okay, but two maybe a little neat or nicer examples that aren't so weird cars. Our team was debating on push and pull, depending on models, models really. Peggy, I think you had an opinion on this one. Yeah. Yeah, because we based on the, the value of the car and also for uh, if for the high luxury car, actually they work with the dealership. So they need more salesperson to um, to deliver how the cars um, function. So we put it in push. But also if like Toyota, they do lots of advertisement to selling their car in a, um, like a mass market. So uh, we'll be pulled. So we put it in between. Yep. So again, um, if we look at push or pull as uh, when does, uh, you know, how does the customer order occur, the customer journey, which is a, a key sort of thing to consider in every product. I would I'd, I'd bias it towards the pull. I understand your point about uh, push. Certainly that's how we run the industry, but there's a lot of customer recall here. There's a lot of what brand do I want? And then I walk to the place and I, and I, I kind of, I, I, I get the, the, the product in, in that way. Um, uh, you know, there are sub-dimensions of the industry that, that be much more pushed. So if I said cars, uh, you know, so maybe that's too broad. So personal cars, I would suggest is quite pull oriented. Uh, if I said car rental, I would say it's push mm -hmm. uh, because then the OEM visits the car rental and creates demand by saying, here's my product, here's an amazing deal. Uh, where they are quite insensitive to the brands, you know, they might much less sensitive than than consumers would be uh, in your personal car choice. Uh, beer? Paul? We actually had a bit of a transition thing going on. We thought like, you know, from a FMCG perspective, it used to be very push, but now with the development of microbreweries, it's almost becoming a pull and it's sort of changing the market a bit. Yeah, so I think that one of the interesting things, and, and this is maybe the challenge, that's why I'm relating it back to other models, pull versus push is sometimes used. It's a neatish thing, but as, I, as you can see, it, it suffers from, it's, it's too simplistic. The world is much more complicated than this. So one of the things you saw in those beer cases is the amount of um, advertising that occurs in the beer industry. Uh, and so if, you know, that wouldn't occur if, if it was simply a point of sale product. Um, but the reality is people get to bars or places that they consume the alcohol and they'll ask for mainly their beer, although that's not strict, they, they, you know, if, if that's not available or something else. And so, you know, the, the other thing is that as we saw with Grupo Modelo uh, and uh, SAB is a massive domination of distribution. So that was their game plan. They could shut out other brands by just not uh, giving them shelf space. Uh, and so, you know, I agree that you could argue beer in compellingly for both. What I'm just pointing out here is that this model is kind of neatish, but, but can be too simplistic, uh, probably uh, not, not too useful at this level. Um, but, but it's important to unpack when does the, you've heard in every answer, well, how does the consumer make the decision? 
And what is the sales process that's going to get me there? How important is distribution channel? And those are the three dimensions that I think are critical to always consider when you're considering a product. And sometimes you can use a push or pull. Sometimes it's obvious. Uh, and beer is probably a great example of not obvious because you, you, you compete by dominating the distribution channel, not through particularly price. We never saw anyone compete really on price. Um, and yet you advertise very, very, very heavily so that people um, recognize you uh, and, and, and create that demand, you know. So, uh, so that is our marketing and push versus pull. So pull, you, you know, these are things where you have higher recall, where the customer makes a decision. Maybe pull would be characterized by higher involvement purchases tend to be um, some pull, but where, where you have distributed purchase decisions. On the other hand, push uh, is in FMCG terms, high recognition items, but also when you have direct sales, you would argue that that's push. So car rental cars is a push model where um, I don't rely on mass market media. What I'm doing is I send out a direct sales force to create a deal every time. Um, obviously, when you have when you need to do massive distribution for pure recognition, um, that's a push. And also latent needs. So if I'm selling a complicated product that addresses a latent need, I'm unlikely to do it in mass media, and that's really going to knock me out of pull. Uh, you know, because I'm trying to address a problem that you don't think you have at the moment. Uh, so um, that's the end of that. Okay. Um, so there's some global advertising, the question about standardizing advertising globally. Uh, and uh, I think that by now we've seen a lot about the cage model and we, you, nobody should be surprised when we say standardized advertising makes sense when uh, there's significant economic advantages and you simply can't produce any advertising in the local country and your brand name is global. But it does not make sense when you have a big cultural uh, difference uh, or obviously if you've got a regulatory difference which simply bans your adverts. But, um, you know, advertising internationally is, is pretty tricky. Uh, you know, so getting a good advert that can work in many countries is... is very tough. Um, and even global agencies tend to be, uh, you know, they tend to have quite weak local performance. So th this is this is a tricky decision, uh, global advertising. Uh, and I'd say where, where you're not sure, it's probably better to just review the material, but let it be uh, locally uh, conceived, uh, if not produced. Uh, production quality in some markets is terrible. All right, so that's our kind of marketing channel selection uh, discussion. Uh, so as we said, the key focus here is always think about the customer journey, uh, understand how the seven Ps fit into that customer journey. What do you need to focus on? Uh, make sure that you have a guiding sentence or statement which covers those four Cs. Am I clear? Am I consistent? Am I competitive? Um, you know, and then when you understand my product, am I a high involvement or low involvement? And am I transformational or informational? Uh, craft your message to solve that so that you're consistent and you tell people this is actually, uh, or you instruct your agencies, this is what I want to see in my adverts. Um, far too much advertising is done globally with kind of scant uh, theoretical backing. Uh, so, so these models presented are... Uh, you, you know, kind of have been tested there. They're fairly, they're consistent, they work. Um, it's not all just people sitting in a room coming up with crazy ideas. That's usually not too, not too useful. Now we have some really interesting stuff on human resources. And this is going to be important for your Orphia, again, your implementation question. I put at the end there, your board has decided you're going ahead. Whatever you've argued, it, you know, there's no negative points, but you've got to say, okay, what am I doing with human resources? It's clearly a critical part of a service-based industry. So, so clearly a staffing policy is concerned with the selection of employees um, uh, around both their skills uh, and uh, corporate culture. Uh, so, you, you know, you've got um, skills, sorry. Skills and then corporate culture. 
Um, and selection in a new country will determine a lot of your success. Skills can be very uh, different. Uh, and also notice at a very senior level, new ventures are much more difficult than established businesses. The scope of challenges that are presented are, are much broader than, than maintenance phase. So, some of you have been in HR would be closer to this. Uh, your book and the, the theory kind of talks about three models, an ethnocentric, which is effectively that you pick your own and you deploy everywhere, polycentric, where um, your, you know, effectively your local subsidiary gets its own management and geocentric, which is kind of this gold standard where you just put the best person in the world in the best place. Um, so ethnocentric is attractive when you simply can't find people in your in the country, when you when it's important for your value that you have a unified corporate culture, when you're trying to transfer knowledge rapidly, um, when you have non-financial controls and know-how that are very important, uh, when loyalty is critical to performance. Um, but it leads to cultural myopia, it leads to low levels of autonomy and it can lead to overly prescriptive and uh, weak performance, even though the performance follows the rules that the performance can be poor. Uh, so you could imagine that uh, when Walmart sends across a whole uh, cater of, of Bentonville you know, graduates to run a German um, you know, supermarket, you get, you get problems. Polycentric approach uh, is very good at adaptation and, uh, and localization but uh, you, you can have a big gap opening up. Uh, it's pretty durable and flexible, uh, but, but you, know, I mean, you might end up with a business which is no longer you know, something that's your core business. Uh, so my, the point we're making here is the higher number of expats that you send, the more ethnocentric the label is gonna be ethnocentric uh, staffing, the higher the control over procedures know-how transfer, um, you know, loyalty, cultural similarity, the lower the localization of that subsidiary. That's not always good. I'm gonna show you some data in a second about what works when. Uh, and so you've got this as a summary, ethnocentric, polycentric, and geocentric. Um, and you'll get, you'll get these slides so you can have a look at this table. All right, let's talk about expatriates. So many companies look for the balance by adjusting their staffing mix to include expatriates. So not just hiring from your local country and dispatching them, but, but taking one of your employees. Uh, you, you tend to find that expatriates have either high technical knowledge or high marketing knowledge. That's really who gets expatted out. Uh, they have several different roles and we're gonna, we're gonna go through that. And they effectively attempt to bring the intent stroke logic, uh, if you recall Peter Drucker or Prahalad and Betis, what do we do? How do we make money? That idea, the intent or logic from the parent into the subsidiary. Uh, so distance matters. The number of expatriates per country varies according to the domestic social capital. So how many qualified people are there domestically will drive how many expats you, you end up trying to uh, utilize. So in, in United States multinationals, uh, something like 60% uh, of employees in Saudi Arabia are, are, are Americans, whereas in the European subsidiaries, maybe 1% are, are Americans. So uh, clearly there's a huge cultural gap in Saudi, but the ability to hire domestic management is, is quite limited. Uh, you know, um, frankly, probably part of their resource curse, right? Uh, there's so much money that it's not... Is it worth it for us as Saudi to go through the grind of, of getting management experience? Um, and Unilever's, Unilever obviously looks at trying to do a lot of localization, but it finds that the cultural glue that holds the company to parent actually weakens if you have only locals. And this is something that's pretty obvious. So the pattern is and for good reason is that initially you have quite a lot of expats in the setup stage, whether it's greenfield or acquisition, uh, then you'll tend to have lower as the operations stabilize, then head office decides, oh my goodness, these people don't do things our way, whatever that means, send out more people. And then you know, maybe five years down the track, 
you get some sort of stabilization at a lower lower number. So this is a typical pattern. It doesn't mean it's good. And, and I think you should, if you're running a subsidiary, or certainly if you're doing your case, uh, make some recommendations about that using some of this insight. Uh, expats just note that they, they have a very high standard that they need to work to uh, because they kind of represent head office. And so um, the job of an expat is by necessity, a cultural ambassador or head office ambassador. And, uh, you know, sometimes that, that's quite. Nicholas, oh. sorry, on the yep. expats, because you see it quite a lot in pharmaceutical industry, especially yep. under management, um, and they rotate relatively quick there. Is there some sort of average turnaround time or does that not really, is that, is that not a thing? I don't know. Um, just... I don't think there's a thing, uh, but they always do quite quickly. We're going to look at why expats fail and go home. Um, okay. Just so stats. Um, you know, so it does tend to be reasonably short. Um, I would suggest that three years is a normal expat lifespan. Yeah. Um, certainly in the motor industry across almost any brand, uh, it's, it's that sort of short. One of the interesting things is when you do it, like that when it's so short it tends to promote highly aggressive autocratic management yeah um so it's not necessarily an innate feature of of the expat it's an incentives problem if i've got three years to achieve some ridiculous goal right which is usually the what the deal is go double share or something crazy the only way i can ever do that is by uh, autocratic management style Right, because you just do not have time to build a culture, upskill people. Uh, you know, you've got two years to to kind of hit hit a hit a number, and a year to polish your resume, and then you, you you're heading back to head office. So, um, uh, three years, I in my experience, is very very common. And what it leads to is um, this kind of autocratic style. And there's papers that show that that's kind of why it happens. So we're going to just spend uh, five minutes here. <clears throat> in, in our groups, what are the roles of expats? So what I'm looking for is for you to come back and say uh, an expat has one of three different roles that you understand or you think you could deploy. So you're thinking about your case, arguably, uh, the SANI or, or FIA. If you were to send expats, what is their job? One of three or four. And I don't mean what their job level is, GM or not GM, but kind of fundamentally, why are you sending an expat? Because it's a key question you need to ask yourself. And, and, and if, you're, if you're guiding these sorts of decisions, it's a key question to ask yourself. So what are the roles I'm looking for? Three or four different roles, uh, and then we'll see what the kind of models are of this. Um, so again, this is just gonna be five minutes in your two groups. Okay, excellent. So what are some of the roles we came up with? Well, uh, can we start first just brainstorming, Nicholas? Um, sure. Came up with the fact that if I'm HQ, I'm going to a local. So as a HQ person, I expect I will bring out my expertise, my technical skills. Yep, so cool. let's say, technical expert. Yeah, and then the next one is to bring the, the culture exchange. Huh? And then um, I think we come up with the third one, which is networking, building the relationship for better collaboration for the future. Okay, cool. Yeah, good. Sounds, sounds pretty good. We had a similar one. So we talked about the same thing around tr tr transfer of knowledge and skill. Um, we talked about the penetration of culture, understanding and aligning values. Um, then we talked about developing people, um, succession planning and building capacity in, in the subsidiary. And then we talked about uh, quality control as well. Um, and then the last thing we just talked about with Vicky was um, the role of kind of disruption in that space and how dangerous that might be in terms of, yeah, barging in and trying to change things rather than working with local. <laughs> yeah. yeah, as they do, as they do. Cool, so yeah, absolutely. So technical expert stroke, uh, you know, bringing those technical advice, culture, you know, culture sort of boosters, um, and then, we, you know, plus uh, networking, uh, people development succession, some quality control. All right, so we've got kind of two models, which I'll show you quickly. So one is obviously they, you've got this kind of head, the boss kind of role. Um, uh, two is a structure reproducer. Uh, so that is, uh, you, you know, uh, along the lines of this cultural exchange. Um, uh, then you've got the technical expert uh, and troubleshooter, which might be quality control or 
people develop. And so when you have a disaster, you know, there tends to be a specific role. Um, and then some sort of operative, which fits somewhere in, I suppose, the middle between, um, you know, maybe culture is a, a combination of uh, two and five. So sometimes you just need somebody to keep the organizational chart right. And other times a functional role is really about, you know, doing um, or, or bringing the culture across because typically functional roles could be done uh, in country. Uh, so there are, there are these kind of five classic uh, areas, uh, but there's another another classification from Hartzig which goes uh, which uses some animal metaphors. Uh, so the bear, this is separate. That's not a combined list, right? They're two competing, whichever one you find uh, the most illustrative. So you've got the bear, which is the head office enforcer, right? This is uh, you know a tough job to have because nobody likes it, but uh, they effectively make sure that head office decisions are applied. Um, you've got the bumblebee, uh, which is this kind of culture exchange uh, person, which is about how do I how do I get them closer to how we do things. Um, this network, uh, which which May was talking about, a spider, you know, which is just about creating this network, making sure that people are talking and talking to head office. Um, and so Hartsey's has got sorry the, these these three. Um, and the other model has five. So yeah, uh, fully agree. So, I, so there's a number of roles that you can use, you know, more than happy with the descriptions we've heard from the groups. Uh, you can use these, it's not wrong. Uh, but, but there are some roles that, that you might choose to send expats for. Uh, expats are expensive. Uh, it's important that you, and they reduce sort of subsidiary autonomy. So it's important that you figure out what are you actually sending them for. So there's quite a wide variety of expat uh, penetration and head office um, you know, international CEOs or foreign born CEOs. Uh, so business programs in Harvard, Stanford, MIT in the US uh, have high levels of foreign students, 20, you know, something like 38. And that's despite the fact that they're in the world's largest economy. So, you, you know, this is hugely competitive. But U.S. corporations in general have a lot of uh, executives from diverse uh, backgrounds. So uh, a lot of Coca-Cola CEOs, five of them have been a foreign. You know, um, Medtronic has a, a Bangladeshi CEO. Avon, I think the CEO may have just stepped down, but uh, Chinese Canadian, 3M, uh, you, you know, has a Swedish CEO. Google currently has a, a, an Indian-born CEO. Microsoft currently has an Indian-born CEO. So this does differ, and it differs by country. Um, obviously, the United States tends to lead this. If you look at uh, other large, important economies, you tend to have far fewer foreign-born CEOs. Uh, and this talks talks to questions that we dealt with, like um, meritocracy, uh, social mobility. Uh, you know, I mean, tightness of culture, and we said that the US tends to have a very loose culture, if you recall that, um, that lecture, uh, and quite a, a strict meritocratic system in general. Uh, this is not clearly uh, every single decision is made like this, but, but they, certainly the data says that they, this is the outcomes. All right, so here's some expatriate failure information. Uh, so U.S. firms have quite high levels of expatriate failure um, compared with European or Japanese. Uh, so something like 10% more, uh, you know, even up to, so 10% is really common. One in 10 of the expatriates fail. It's expensive when they fail. Uh, something like 40000 to a million dollars. There's These aren't just direct costs. These are relocation costs and direct and, and, and that. Uh, but also you get damage to subsidiaries. So you can imagine somebody who goes, tries to enforce head office decisions, and ends up with a shambles. Uh, this is a very expensive problem to fix. Um, and you know, failure rate increases with increasing difficulty, such as I'm moving into a very different cultural. So when my cage distance increases, your risks of, uh, of failure do climb. So here's the kind of top five reasons for US multinationals. Um, expatriate spouse, uh, you know, not being able to adapt, the employee not being able to adjust, other family reasons, so children's schooling, uh, security, etc. cetera, uh, uh, more the manager's personal emotional maturity and um, 
the fact that larger overseas responsibilities. This is a really key point. And what you'll see uh, in a couple of slides is when you repatriate people who've done expat postings, uh, there's a high level of attrition. And that really follows from this this idea that it's sometimes from a head office perspective, they go, okay, I'm sending you to be a general manager of a unit in a foreign country. And it's the same as being a general manager in the home country. And, and I would say that the evidence is quite clear that it's not. The scope tends to be much more broad because you're solving problems of localization adaptation. Whereas in the head office one, you're really sort of uh, measured often on compliance. How well are you sticking to the script? And that different requirement is it pushes people very hard. And so sometimes a person who does very well in head office because everything is controlled and they are strict procedural type of successes, they get into expatriate organizations or, or positions and they're now needing to localize and adapt and deal with things on the fly. And that can be very, very challenging. And the people who do succeed you then bring them back and put them back in the bureaucracy and they struggle with that. They go, hold on, I went out there, I made 100 decisions a day, it worked out, we made a lot of money, I come back here and I'm chastised for stepping out of the rule book. It's a very common complaint, um, but this is what leads to that. That's that. When you expat people, they tend to, it, it's, it tends to be a lot of work. Um, you know, European firms, now you can infer what you want about Europeans and how they answer the surveys, but, uh, you know, it was really blamed on their spouse. Uh, and Japanese firms, uh, the scope problem, um, a new environment, uh, you know, lack of competence and, and the spouse is actually the, the lowest list of the problem. So you can see different cultures deal with this both in terms of their culture differently, in terms of how they report the problems, you know, uh, that's different. Uh, and and this, the problem of international re responsibilities, uh, perhaps, you know, the Japanese culture uh, being very tight as it is, when those individuals are, ex, uh, you know, are expats and are coping with a wide variety of novel situations, that might be fairly unusual. Okay, so although many of these reasons are about families uh, coping, a good selection does lead to better outcomes, clearly. And there's this model, I think it might be in the book, of Medenhall and Odu. There's four dimensions, self-orientation, others' orientation, perceptual ability, and cultural toughness. Uh, so uh, I'm not sure how different this is from, um, from what makes good executives in general, but the point here is that the self-orientation and others' orientation is a good degree of self-regulation uh, and toughness. Uh, in other words, can you go somewhere and uh, regulate and balance your behavior when you can see it's clearly not being effective? Um, and what it excludes is those people who uh, might be tolerated in some circumstances because they simply produce good results, but they rub everybody up the wrong way. That is almost guaranteed to not work in an expatriate situation where uh, you know, they may not have all those tools. Um, <clears throat> one of those four terms, self-orientation, self-esteem, confidence, mental well-being. Others' orientation is how effectively can I interact? Do I self-regulate? Do I pick up on, on signals? Um, uh, perceptual ability is, is some sort of, you know, reasonable sensitivity and the toughness is just, can I manage the fact that the world is so very different? Uh, Matsushita, which is a, a large Japanese firm, uh, you know, has a slightly different model. As I said, these are two competing ones. Uh, they're both fine. So they say, well, you know, do you have the technical skill? Uh, do you have management ability? Do you have international flexibility? In other words, are you willing to learn and, uh, and adapt? And um, language facility. And finally, you know, are you vigorous enough to, to go through this? So, you know, as you can see, this one is a lot less orientated around my you know, personal attributes. Am I self-reflective and am I a nice guy? And they're saying effectively, if you've got enough energy um, uh, and international flexibility adaptation, you're probably going to make it. Uh, <clears throat> I've just included this just to you know show you that it is it's always and if, if any of you have experienced being an expat uh it can really be quite 
quite all over the, you know, there can be this curve of it feels terrible, then it's fantastic because it's novel and, you know, you're taking your spouse to eat somewhere new and it's all uh, culturally different. Then it gets interesting. <laughs> then it gets very, very tough. And then, you know, it gets more sort of uh, uh, integrated and, and, and stabilizes out. So uh, it certainly is a, a roller coaster, a roller coaster. Uh, I think that you find some people that are professional expats and, um, you, you know, it's, um, it's not always a good thing that some people choose to do a career permanently posting to novel places. When it's inside the context of this is how you perform in this multinational, uh, I would suggest that it means something very different when you're reviewing CVs and I think to you and you're in this industry. Um, then when somebody uh, migrates between countries simply so that they can stay expatted in, in countries, which uh, tends to lead to a very particular type of individual. And um, my experience is difficult to get results out of hiring those people. And that brings us on to this idea of the global mindset. Uh, so, you know, Baham and Heimer said that really uh, a global mindset is this idea of trying to be an intercultural mediator and change agent, a uh, cross-border coach and mediator. And really, the, this is about competing frames of reference. Uh, it's about shrinking that gap. Things like administrative this, uh, difference can be quantified. You can send it to legal people. It tends to be reasonably easy to sort out. Economic differences um, you know, can be somewhat resolved. Geographic, again, administrative geographic tends to be quite uh, you can write them down and assess it and committees can review it. So organizations tend to have processes to deal with that. But cultural and economic differences can be more sophisticated. And, and you know, and a global executive is somebody who's able to reframe those problems back in head office in the terms that head office can understand and wants to hear. So they go on to say that it's more than just a set of skills. It's a, a, a way of being and it's balancing perspectives. Um, when they're repatriated, it's important. Something like 40 to 60% will quit within three years, which is a huge number. And it's a very expensive problem. You've just sent somebody, you spent time overseas. They potentially have done all this good work. You've got a lot of skills and then uh, half of them will leave you within three years. Um, and they're often slotted back, as I said, to mid-level jobs. And they find that their scope went from high degree of autonomy uh, and a lot of problem solving through to a much more regulated uh, bureaucratic role, which is something that they may have left, but, but you know, certainly not appreciated anymore. Uh, the scope is always broader because you're making novel decisions. Uh, and I'd suggest that the higher the cage distance, the broader and the more adaptable the manager will need to have been in order for that subsidiary to be successful. Uh, and it's just something to note when you're repatriating um, or advising on this, that uh, you know, balancing this problem is important. When you expat somebody, you end up with a lot of skills if they survive it. Uh, and, and trying to use that as best as possible is, is more valuable. Uh, the reality is a lot of them quit. Uh, so here's like uh, the stats. Um, <clears throat> you know, something like 60 or two thirds don't know what position they all hold. They're vague about it, their career progression, uh, or even they took what they feel was a lower level job. Uh, and so something like 15%, one in six will leave within one year, and one in three, one in two will leave within three years, slightly different data sets, so quite high. One of the challenges is actually judging your expatriates. So if you use headquarters metrics, if you use Walmart metrics in Germany, you'll get a Walmart in Germany, right? Because that's what you're paying people to reproduce for you. They'll do it. And you just won't make any money out of it. And so sometimes head office metrics, although they're well refined and well accepted in head office, they represent, we come back to the term, the dominant logic of the head office. Um, and people will deliver on that, those incentives. And so it's important to kind of make sure that you've got a blend of approaches for, for evaluating. Uh, home country managers tend to love their metrics because they're far away and they, you know, they, they feel that it's not under their grip, uh, whereas host country managers can be biased in their own frames of reference. And often the solution is to use a group of metrics so that it's clear what's expected, 
and some sort of um, other metrics that are more local country oriented, you know, that can be a 360 degree performance appraisal and, you know, those sorts of, uh, let's say, strategic map outcomes as opposed to pure, pure number outcomes. The reason you're doing this is just because you really want to judge if this person is working out for you before it's. All right, so we're right at the end of our slides here. So we just got, I think, two more. Um, so technical knowledge is very important. Uh, motivation is important and adaptability is important. And then really, you know, as we saw from the Matsushita model, this uh, adaptability is, you know, this ability to convert my head office frame of reference. And you saw that, you know, that comment into how do I translate between head office and the subsidiary culture? Uh, so motivation alone is, uh, is an important measure. You can see that as described here. Motivation is a key driver to outcomes. So frankly, if somebody is motivated to succeed, it's probably going to work. Uh, their technical knowledge, their adaptability, and their motivation creates this metric of, of their knowledge um, or their applicable knowledge. And that is the second uh, and very important uh, outcome and also drives the level of success of the subsidiary unit. Why are you looking at this? Because it's important that you pick someone who's got technical skills, who is adaptable, and who is highly motivated to do the job. But how much is too much? Um, well, I'm just going through this a little more quickly. Uh, we've got maybe one of the key things is that uh, technical knowledge tends to be um, more international and therefore will tolerate lower autonomy. Marketing knowledge tends to be local uh, and therefore um, higher autonomy tends to work. And, and here's the kind of research output. Uh, and again, you've got the performance measure here. And you've got the cage kind of note up at the top. Uh, so that's coming next. So low expatriate ratio, you know, if you've got low or high, it doesn't matter. But when you put expatriates and you have a high, you know, when you've got a lot of expatriates and you start with high technical knowledge, you add value. If you don't have high technical knowledge, expatriates simply reduce uh, autonomy. And we're going to see that in the next slide. So one of the key answers here is that expatriates should reflect the skills you're trying to deploy. So when you have high knowledge, expatriates, and high expatriates, you get high performance. And when you have high marketing knowledge and high numbers of expatriates, um, sorry, high marketing knowledge and low numbers of expatriates, you get better performance. And we would break out if we had enough time. So, but I'm just going to fast forward to, to discuss the why of this. So marketing, as we've said, is something that is very specific and mainly local. So if you have a lot of expats, what you tend to do is you get head office marketing, whereas locals will produce locally appropriate marketing. So that's product, pricing, promotion, all those decisions. So expatting people out, um, in high numbers, even if you have high marketing knowledge, this is the high high expat curve, does not does not lead to greater outcomes. So this is high expat curve here, and this is high expat curve. But when you have a lot of technical knowledge, expatting a lot of people out tends to work. The difference being, most of the technical knowledge is internationalizable. Those people will go and solve problems for you in the local country. Whereas marketing, you know, isn't, it doesn't, uh, you don't get that scale like that. And this is our final slide. So in general, higher autonomy is better for subsidiaries in, in foreign countries. Uh, so what you've got here is um, this question of subsidiary autonomy and subsidiary performance. So this is autonomy. And this is performance. And so you can see when you have higher autonomy, in general, you have higher levels of performance. Right? And you, when you have um, 
low institutional quality, your head office is more comfortable in giving high levels of autonomy to your subsidiary when they have a lot of expats out there. So, uh, you know, it, it feels like a bit of a tangle because, uh, you know, because we're doing this quite quickly, but let's just, let's just cover what we've said. When you have poor institutional quality, so you're not sure about the courts or the reliability of contracting or policing, your head office tends to give low autonomy to the subsidiary when there are low levels of expats. If you have great courts, autonomy and expat level is negatively related to the number of expats. In other words, if I send lots of head office people, of course, I'll get a, a low autonomous unit, right? But the reality is when you're not confident of the, the institutional quality, head office tends to want everything to be approved by head office unless they get a lot of expats. This is just a function of how businesses operate, right? And many of you would feel the same way. If you created a subsidiary in some developing market, you would want a lot of decisions to come back to head office because you're just unsure of how it's going to work out. The alternative is you expect people. My point is that higher levels of autonomy, clearly at the bottom here, whether, you know, I mean, in, in any circumstance, higher levels of autonomy will lead you to uh, typically better performance. So the expat decision is something that you should take seriously. You should only put expats in areas that they're really going to add a lot of value. You should figure out what their role is um, because it's a key decision. Um, and, you know, if you make it well, you really boost the ability of your head office to work with a subsidiary. Its chance of success goes up. Uh, then, So don't ignore it and don't make it a, a last decision that you do at the end of, you know, this is, this is a key, key question. Yeah, I think it's a fascinating area, this Nick, because I just wanted to add. I mean, I'm, I, I'm, I know a few people will be as well, but I've had, had experience. I was brought in to work in Singapore by a local company who, who sought out my, I suppose, my experience and expertise and brought it to the firm. And I think it's fascinating that that, that line between what, like you say, what value you add and the experience you have. But also, I work in a cultural venue, like we're an arts and culture venue, right? We work, I work in education. So my, my ability to understand the local systems here very quickly and understand how the education works, how teaching culture works, as well as trying to then incrementally push certain agendas and, and kind of reform, it's kind of been the story of the last four years. So it's, it's, it's fascinating listening to it, this lecture and, and kind of a, thinking about how I've sat inside some of these systems and how I've had to understand some of these differences. The real risk for, for, I mean, let's imagine you were expatted by a company, but if you went back home and somebody put you in, um, let's say, an appropriate, you know, the, the, the kind of teaching role or that you, you had four years ago, you'd go, you know, I've grown so much, this role hasn't changed. Uh, and you can imagine the kind of dissatisfaction that creeps in. Um, totally. I think even just relating it to, I think, because I, I, I technically brought a skill set that was lacking in the firm, I've been given a lot of autonomy by the leadership to yep. kind of run it, go, you know, a lot of, as you say, a lot of rope to run. I would imagine if I went back into a UK firm, I would be under a lot tighter guidance. Yeah. Yep. And then, so what happens is you go, okay, that's enough for me. <laughs> Thanks guys. And then and, and leave. Yeah. So I think that as you make these decisions on behalf and, and for Orphea, and these are, these are key sort of thoughts to have. You know, so remember the final question is, okay, you, you've got to make it work. What are you doing about that? One of the questions you should be asking um, is, okay, cool. Do I want to expect people? How many, what are they going to be responsible for doing? So, all right, we're going to break now for, for 10 minutes, uh, actually uh, nine minutes. Uh, and, and then we'll come back. And what we're going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to put those questions up anyway during the break. And, we're then going to go into our two groups and spend probably 15 minutes, um, you know, in, in breakout, come back, answer the questions, and, and that'll, be, that'll be us. So I'll see you all in, in nine minutes out. Okay, so are we, are we back? Do we have a minute left or something? Okay, cool. 
Um, we're going to now break into groups uh, for 15 minutes. As I said, um, we're going to make a group. We've got two groups, uh, the split of the questions. So if you're in group two, you're going to do question one, one, a, two, and three. And if you're in group one, you're going to do uh, four, five, and five, a. Uh, so one is effectively a marketing end and four, five, and five, a is this expat end. Uh, so 15 minutes, I hope, is, is reasonable for this. And then it's just about presenting that. Um, perhaps if, if you put it in your in PowerPoint, we can share a screen and go through your three questions. Right, I'm going to open the rooms. And in 15 minutes, let's come back. Sayon, are you in a group? Ah. And recording. All righty, group two or group one? Um, which group's going first? Yeah, I think our group can our group can start first. Cool. I can share. Oh, should I share what we've we've got as a few notes, and then Vicky can jump in and the team and Gion. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Okay, only very simple, there we go. Um, yep, so I think first and foremost, we put them, um, we decided we're chatting about them being collaborators and we kind of was talking to them, how they um, segment into different uh, segments in terms of um, Sunny being more low cost, um, uh, to medium, looking at efficiency and standardization, and then was finding elements in the case where PM seemed to be more focused on elements of innovation and development and around customization. So we was having some discussions about the differences between those two areas. Okay, because we only have, each group has done their part. So um, other group, can we get some comments or insights or questions about this? I, I do see them as a competitor in some way because, um, I mean, the passage you mentioned that Sunny has always wanted to buy PM, right? Although they're not listed in the exhibit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, of course, the one is on a cheaper price, one is on r and So I thought they had some element of competition as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. I, so, I, I... <laughs> Monica? No, it's me. I, I, I think from the case study itself, um, Sandy said they are always in love with PM. I, I guess Sandy is always looking for a way or um, to, 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 to go global or, inter or internationalize, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I will still insist like their collaborator because Sandy is looking for a partner who can help them yep. to go global. Okay, so I mean, I agree. Like I'm quite happy that they, that they, they um collaborator, but let's just have a look at two dimensions that you can use uh, to do this. So um, the first dimension <clears throat> is what, what you know, I mean, you refer to as the market, uh, but you actually touched on both, just let's try organize it pretty well. So do we compete in the same market? So let's put compete and not compete. And what you've mentioned here is that Sani is effectively- Nicolas, in... are, you, are you recording? Uh, I oh yeah, recording. Yeah, okay, sorry. Yep. So you've got competing and not competing markets. And, and I would tend to agree that we are, you know, that Sani is not competing, uh, not directly competing in the main with, uh, with Putzmeister. Of course, there is a little bit of competition, but in the main, they're probably in the not compete segment. And then the next dimension is uh, actually resource. So this is like resource-based theory. 
Uh, and and you, you bring it up interestingly in your answer, although um, just that, as I said, we're just trying to organize. And you say here that Putzmeister is big on innovation. So I, I would agree with that. What is Sani's resource, do you think, or group of resources um, that it is bringing to the table? You mean Sani? Yeah. Sani's resources? I think the need the resources is a low cost, uh, low cost uh, uh, labor, and then uh -huh. PM's case is uh, uh, R and D, and then uh, technology. That's right. I think Sandy's also got a good international footprint. Uh, probably a better international sales uh, organization. Um, you know, and I think those would be reasonable things to put as resources. You know, we don't know exactly how strong they are, but it does seem to be uh, more broadly spread. So what we've got here is same and different S being same and D being different. And so what we've, we're saying is that the resources are pretty different. And again, uh, you know, let's, uh, and that's why I would tend to agree that this is where they sit. Their, comp their market competition is pretty limited and their resource requirement is, um, is the overlap is pretty uh, dissimilar. It's not exactly dissimilar. I mean, obviously the Sandy does say they do a lot of research, so I'm quite happy with that. But I agree with the overall perspective that in the main, they are more collaborators than competitors. And obviously this zone over here is absolute competition. We have the same resources, we have the same markets, uh, you know, and that's just a pure, pure competition. But from the case study itself, in terms of resources like Sandy, uh, they are targeting on, uh, even though they are low cost, but uh, they are targeting quite a wide range of products. Yeah. But uh, PM is more on a niche market, mainly mm -hmm. focusing on one or two, like pumping or like those equipment. Yeah, that's right. And that's why uh, I agree that they don't compete in the main. So, you know, like if we took their competition level, it's probably 20% of their products overlap and compete. And then similarly, that's why we've put them in the not compete column. And similarly, when you look at their resources, uh, Putzmeister is really looking at very focused innovation for a couple of markets, whereas Sani has got a broader spread of product and their resource is probably you know, more around that sales organization. Cool. All right, next. Um, yep, yeah, we so just to summarize, we we pulled out the 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 key brand promise for us around the quality will change the world. And I think the case talks quite a lot from both sides of um, Sunny and PM around the importance of quality, albeit in different areas of, of the markets. Um, so we looked at the four different C's. Um, for us, we felt that clarity was there for both brands, very strong and distinct. Um, consistency, um, we were talking um, about um, particularly Sani being the biggest and highest standard and also how PM aspires to do that so that, that there's consistency across both brands in this, in this area. Um, can I deliver credibility? I mean, uh, PM is highlighted as we, uh, Vicky was talking about the hidden champion, the, the, the great elephant. Um, and again, we know that Sani has that large um, uh, network um, uh, uh, and we know that they're, that they're reputable, highly reputable in that space. Um, and and Sani in uh, the Chinese market compared to their competitors, it was being perceived as the highest standards as well. Mm -hmm. So it's credible. Yeah. Um, and then we had a good bit of a debate, I suppose, on competitiveness. Um, we know that during acquisition that there's drop in revenue. And so we were kind of talking about whether the, the fourth C has been impeded by um, uh, in terms of like a wait and see. We're not quite sure yet that this competitiveness is maintained um uh, through the acquisition so that was kind of our final thoughts on on, on that section uh, other groups comments on this but well, i have a like uh, even though that i mean i was uh, in this team uh i i mean our team i mentioned about Okay, the sales, the uh, sales volume uh, decreased the after like acquisition. But when we look at uh, this competitive uh, competitiveness as a brand, I think my 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 understanding is that 
what kind of like a, a power of a brand that this acquisition will bring in that will be uh, related to competitiveness. That, Sorry. am I, yeah, is my yeah. understanding uh, correct or like do we have yeah. to get? So I am, uh, you know, my, my comment would be that uh, I think it, it's, uh, it, certainly in the case, there's quite a lot of um, note about this idea that they'll remain separate and they have a single brand strategy in each country. Um, and I think that, you know, that, that, you know, it's difficult to kind of um, maybe merge the two. Um, it would be interesting to see, you know, how they market. Uh, but you can imagine now you've got a very big brand promise. You're saying we do everything. We've got quality. Uh, I think it's unlikely Putzmeister is going to compete in the Chinese market where you've got high levels of overcapacity. Um, you know, it just looks like such a big market. Everybody wants to be in there. And you, you kind of go, okay. Um, and so perhaps, you know, you, you, would, you would argue that there might be the ability to put out a brand promise that kind of was, um, uh, you know, kind of tweaked uh, in, in the market. So for, for the Chinese market where Sani kind of is, is the dominant player, uh, you know, it might be, you know, the German, German quality as you've put here in a German quality. I think the competitiveness question is more about competitive as a brand, differentiated as a brand. Not so much as, you're not, we're not trying to wrap the company question into that, just is that a competitive uh, place to be? Uh, you know, so I'd argue that, that that's just fine. But maybe in each country, you would, you'd have to just be sensitive that you haven't over combined them, that maybe in some countries where you put Smeister, you, but you one have of a brand. The yeah, from, from one of the exhibits of the case study, I found that majority of the companies, they, when they are choosing a company to acquire, like out of 10, seven of them are choosing a Germany company. So I'm not really sure how competitive it is for acquisition with a Germany company, even though they are high standard, you know, high quality. Yeah, so I mean, this, this, this is just a brand question. Can you sell based on a promise of quality? Uh, and I'd say, it's probably not, I mean, it's not inconsistent with with, with the idea. Uh, you know, I mean, I don't think there's enough German companies to flood the Chinese market. I mean, the market's so big. All right, cool. Last question. Uh, that's where we ran out of time. <laughs> More time. Um, yeah, so I suppose we, we only got to this very quickly in the dying seconds, um, but we looked yep. at PM for pull factor around customer loyalty. Um, and then on, on Sunny, we were just discussing around the, the factors of pull. Um, but yeah, feel free, team, to, to, to jump in on that. Some, just some general comments then, open it up for everybody. Well, I have a look on that one. Uh, it, just looking at the case study very at a cursory glance, it might be push purely because, I guess, as we've mentioned before in this slide, that Sunny's strength is that low cost labor. Um, and, you know, comparing it to other industries, I don't see an industry where low cost labor has often been um, a, a pull sort of factor, if that makes any sense. So I, I suppose, I think that again, you know, and this is just the, the question to, to stimulate the kind of discussion. We spoke about a couple of things. How does this consumer purchase happen? So you're quite right. When you have a customer who's loyal to a brand, um, you, you know, they're going to uh, order from the factory uh, you know, when they need the product. So Putzmeister almost definitely has a stronger pull factor uh, to that. However, when Putzmeister wants to convert new customers, they're very definitely going to have a direct sales strategy. In my mind, it's a complex product. It's a high risk product. So if you're used to using a product that's 5% inferior, you still aren't likely to change just because you think there might be 5% out there. This is expensive equipment doing big jobs. Uh, you know, it tends to be kind of very risk averse. Um, you know, so this is decidedly a um, high involvement informational product. Uh, so I think it's going to have a lot of direct sales. So quite happy that you've got existing customers are going to be more pulled for PM. New sales will be, I'd suggest, you know, a, a, bit of, a bit of push there because of how you're going to have to sell it. Uh, you're going to go out there, create custom deals. Uh, and Sani... So any, you know, depending on where they are in the market, uh, could be, you know, a very similar answer. You've got loyal customers potentially. Um, the case does talk about this kind of very commoditized market in China, and so it may be a lot about uh, direct sales. All often, um, if if you have very homogenous, the case says very homogenous market. So 
you know, you would, we don't really know. And that's why either answer is okay here. We don't know how good their brand is in terms of, you know, um, it, those brand attributes, how strong is it, how unique is it, et cetera, in China. We just know that they're a big company, probably do, does an okay job, like in terms of the brand. All right. Thank you. Let's go to the other group. Nicholas, you only managed to complete one question. Okay. Okay, Sanjay. Yeah, sure. So uh, we've gotten about. We're gonna have a good class discussion, then, right? <laughs> we. I reckon this probably falls into five uh, alpha as well. Just yep, fair. I'm gonna address both of them together. Um, so we've gotten about just as background to what we were doing. We got about halfway through it until we realised that everything that we'd done actually didn't relate to the Upsala model. So we had to then go back. Yeah, fair enough. The and go from there. Um, so our understanding based off the case study as we can sort of put it there so we can engage some discussion here is that Sany has already achieved step one. And if we looked at Germany as the as, as the case study and the focal point there, they've already achieved step one because I think if I remember correctly, um, Cindy, feel free to jump in here, um, that they'd already established a network with a company there. So from our understanding, um, they'd already set up Step one, they've already made a commitment decision in that point. So therefore, the only other two remaining phases were then to effectively establish that foreign sales subsidiary and then drive further into that market commitment um, to then drive that feedback loop to then move. Yeah, so just to refresh everyone on, on the model, um, you know, you, so you've got this, um, the Upsala model has got uh, effectively two dimensions. The strict one has one, but let's just, what we put in the lecture. So here is complexity on this, um, you know, and that means I go from export through to uh, subsidiary, right? More and more complex. And at the bottom is more and more unrelated. So unrelated, positive. And so I think what we see, and your answer here is, is, is just perfect, is they started with sporadic exports to markets that were regional. They mentioned India, they mentioned Bangladesh. So you, you can imagine just on their periphery. So that is low complexity. It's exporting, right? You just sell your, your box and you move on. And it is to markets that are probably pretty similar to you. And then, you know, those the, the export continues to more and more dissimilar markets. So, you know, there, there's some note that they, they do more of that. And then what they do is uh, you know, they, they list and, um, you know, this is quite a big entity and they set up a German greenfield site. So this is now high complexity and high there. So they probably, you know, as you've said, they've got a foreign subsidiary market. So that's a little bit higher complexity. So that starts to happen. And the point we're making is that this is number one, two, three, and getting to Germany where they actually established a, a greenfield site and they mentioned that they've got 90% local employees, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then now they're going for an acquisition, which is one step up, even more complex, um, you know, because you're gonna have to, remember we saw Faye Milk, greenfield means effectively you can, you can control almost everything about it. So uh, we, we made the comment that often firms, they feel that they don't have a lot of internationalization experience, but a key technology uh, might do a greenfield because they'll control all parts of it and figure it out as they go. Uh, and they don't have this big learning curve of integrating companies. Um, and so that's why I would suggest that the acquisition is more complex at five than, than the greenfield. And, and I suppose what this is pointing out is that you have this kind of journey, which is going along the lines of the Uppsala, increasing complexity over time. That was, that was really the point of that. So I'm yeah, quite happy with what you put. Cool, next. Okay, well, next. Um, all right, so I mean, you know, five and five A. So let's just talk about expatriates um, and, uh, and Sani. What are our thoughts about, um, what does the case say about expatriates? How many expatriates? So anybody, you know, just say, how many expatriates would you put into to Putzmeister if you bought it as Sani, uh, you know, up front over time? And if you if you can remember those slides, because they were like 30 minutes ago now, like what, what, would, what would the job be? Technology. 
Yep, cool. Okay. So would you put lots, little, um, technical experts, I think is what you're saying, right? Uh, yeah. But also like uh, uh, culturally, uh, they are uh, different. So German culture and then uh, Chinese culture. So uh, I think kind of like the uh, expert, uh, expert the who can play a role of a cultural ambassador will be uh, yeah necessary. Yeah, I, sup I suppose it depends on the kind of the job levels maybe, but it feels like putting too many too many expats out there doesn't seem like the strongest move. I think it's important that they understand the local um, labor market and that they understand the, those cultural differences that Ji Young's talking to. So I can't imagine it's going to be a high level of, of, of expats. Well, I mean, so we don't know, right? So I, I suppose let's, that's what we're just talking about. So um, uh, what I've heard from Ji Young is it'd probably be some technical uh, and maybe, you know, maybe uh, so. Not sure, like the, the ambassador. Like the, I mean, PM is focusing on uh, uh, quality, and then uh, SENI is focusing on efficiency. But right, at I, the same I agree time, with that. yeah. As, uh, as a, but on the, on the other hand, local employees in Germany are quite happy that uh, they were acquired by a uh, SENI, uh, which means that uh, I mean, ger uh, German employees have autonomy uh, from SENI as well. Yes. So. I, I would not put uh, so many expats uh, in, <laughs> in PM uh, from SENI, but uh, I mean, cultural integration is really key to make sure that this integration is successful. Yeah, so yeah, I agree. Um, some other comments? If I remember the previous slides correctly, Nick, it was you wanted a high amount of technical experts and a low amount of marketing experts. Is that a, is that correct? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So if you've got a subsidiary uh, taking over their marketing with some foreign view, and here's a great example, right? Could you imagine a situation where Sani expats out the entire marketing department from China and believes that'll work? Uh, like, yeah. like I go, it's you know the great thing about business is. You kind of go, no, that'll never work. And uh, I'm not trying to, I'll go, no, it, it would never work. <laughs> so <laughs> fully agree with that. So Ji Young's made a couple of points. Let's just, let me, you know, um, we're going to work on this with you. So one is, I, I think that we all agree uh, there'd be some technical exchange. And I would probably use the word exchange. I would suggest that if I was SANI, I would ask for several engineers from PM to be expatted into my SANI operation. Um, and they would be technically very good and perhaps they'd be quite senior because I'd really like some of those skills inside SANI, right? And uh, the fastest way to do that, as Paul said, from his personal experience is you get somebody with those skills and you bring them over. And June, you're in that HR environment, you can imagine, I think that the, the knowledge transfer would be, would be efficient um, uh, reasonably. And so I don't, I don't think you could take one loaner, loan PM person, pluck them in the middle of SANI and hope for the best because it's a huge organization. Their market capitalization in 2006 was like 20 billion US dollars. So uh, there's kind of a minimum scale here, I think, to, to achieve an outcome. Uh, so so there would be, I would suggest an exchange would be useful uh, and just pragmatically. Uh, uh, and but from the, be... case that, from the case that the uh, SANI did send a group of engineer to PM to learn from them and show respect, right? Yeah. And to innovate some like high quality uh, product that they create together to bring that synergy on like at start. That's what mentioned Absolutely. in the case that and, and so that makes sense, right? I mean, you, you can kind of see the value of that. So if you expected a group of people, as Vicky's pointing out, they will learn from PM because they'll work in PM, let's say for a year or two years and you'll bring them all home and they will have been indoctrinated in many ways in the PM. So the key point we're making here is that we want to get knowledge out of PM into SANI in this technical quality environment. Also technical specifications uh, where the case makes note that SANI, the developed markets are extremely fiddly with their regulations. Uh, and so SANI needs that if they want to compete in many of these markets. They, they just got to get these, these specifications right. And they make note how many people are employed in Germany just to figure it out. So 
Uh, I think that an exchange would be a good term. Uh, I think there would be a number of people for the reasons Vicky's just pointed out, because I want to bring back learning into SANI as the SANI person. I would still suggest bringing some PM people into SANI. Um, but I, I'm not sure we're really trying to change PM's technical department. We're trying to share that knowledge in a way that's non-destructive, right? Uh, maybe the next thing is uh, just from from our, uh, our discussion. But, is but what, what what about that? Uh, Nick, in the case study itself, right? Uh, there are two very conflict. Not sure this is culture or directions or whatever. Sani is looking for aggressive expansion. PM mm -hmm. is looking for a stable, and also yep. according to the Germany uh, GDP growth or whatever. So when uh, Sani is asking for 30% increment in a year, which is the whole management of PM doesn't think it's realistic and that create conflicts as well. So this is cultural conflicts or direction conflicts or what conflicts in, in, in the sense of like, what is that? Yeah, so, uh, you know, it's a good point. So firstly, we were just talking technical. So I think the technical question could stand alone and you would probably do that for, for, for the goals that we've just elaborated. Uh, now you've got this different, um, so I just wanted to, uh, let me just finish off the second point, which is uh, we also had a term called the spider role, right, from, from that one model, uh, which is simply about creating communication channels between the two companies. Uh, and that's a good early stage, simply getting people to be able to talk to each other. So some SANI people moving to PM, simply to be able to improve, not to influence, but just to keep communication, cash flow budgeting, inventory management, uh, that sort of thing, just, you know, the who calls who, uh, you know, will, will definitely be useful over time. So now Vicky raises another point. Well, okay, now you've got a big divergence in sales, uh, sales forecasts. Uh, you know, is there, is there a reasonable way of solving this? I mean, this is kind of an intractable problem. You'll, you'll find it occurs all the time, uh, particularly when you have very high growth, aggressive companies like Sani, who are used to a Chinese market room. Sani started in 1989. And by 2012, they're acquiring Putzmeister, which is a hundred something year old company. So, so Sani's experience of the world is that you produce a product and you double your sales. Uh, Putzmeister's experience of the world is we need to be taken over because we have no more cash because uh, the developed markets are so sluggish. And so, you know, um, Vicky, I'd imagine that the resource Sani brings to the table is this big network, a lot of knowledge of international markets. And perhaps some SANI people uh, advising Putzmeister on international markets would be useful, right? Some like in the sales team type of area where you go, okay, you think we can sell all this stuff? Uh, you know, uh, bring people over here and we'll, we'll figure out what is our actual internationalization strategy. You know, as, as we saw, PM thought they're going to go to China. I, th I think that that's highly unlikely. And in a postscript, uh, it didn't happen for good reason, you know, the Chinese market was homogenous, oversubscribed. <laughs> PM going in there would have the wrong cost structure. It would be uh, difficult. Um, so, yeah, I think that it probably, Sani would expect some sales expertise. Yeah, so we would actually, I thought of, uh, actually thought of uh, Sani actually get PM. Uh, one of the uh, objective is to, they're trying to penetrate the Europe market. Yeah, the whole absolutely. Europe market. And then they can actually sell a higher price to their products. Yeah, so, so what you could end up with is co-branding as a potential outcome, right? You could, PM could uh, quality assure your SANI product and then put a PM badge on it, right? This is, doesn't seem impossible to do. Uh, so long as you've got the R&D and regulations right, uh, you could do that. So um, uh, I agree with Vicky, it's a key thing to solve and you solve that really by having some expat sales guys in there so that they're part of the team. And it requires that spider role really importantly because you don't want to have head office being very frustrated, oh, PM's not doing what we want, where's the 30% growth? You know, just because China, the Chinese market has made the real expectations of Sani maybe unrealistic about what they could achieve. Um, you know, as the postscript says, they didn't get the 30% because it's not that PM was waiting on Sani, it's just that the market was particularly um, slow. So I think we all agree on a couple of other things. The bear role, which is this enforcer role, would be probably very damaging and not wanted by anybody, right? So, so it's important that you go, oh, yeah, we, we don't want that because that's a decision. And that's, it, you know, it would certainly strike me as, as reasonable. 
the culture, the B role would be, I think, uh, onerous. It will be very long time before these two cultures merge. Uh, you just, you're talking massive cultural gaps, expectation gaps. So probably start somewhere with just improved communication. Um, and then the other model, we, we've said it's technical experts, both technical as in, uh, I, I know how to design machines, but technical sales, you know, like the sales guy. Uh, and, and by that, we don't mean managers. We mean people who, who do the business. You know, so maybe a tech, it could be a marketing technical expert, but we've, we've just identified two groups that, that we think would be um, uh, really use, useful. We also agree that you don't probably need supervisors in, in PM, right? Um, PM exists, it works, it's doing its thing. Uh, so that's not likely. You might expect some other technical people in procurement because you may be able to share a lot of procurement knowledge here. Perhaps Sani is able to procure components more effectively, certainly. Um, I imagine they would do that quite quite early on in the piece. Um, they have promised to not do too much, so they might not centralize procurement, but I certainly would suggest that expatting some procurement specialists um, to see if you can lower um, PM's procurement costs would be valuable uh, and vice versa. So if Sani wants to sell into Europe, they're going to need some procurement from expertise from PM um, for, for some specialized process. So yeah, uh, you know, I think that that's the that's the kind of discussion that would be valuable. Uh, and when you talk in terms of numbers, Germany is clearly a high institutional quality market. And so we're really talking about transfers of knowledge. That's why we've only said procurement technical specialists, uh, design technical specialists, sales technical specialists, not let's send over a swathe of managers or structural, you know, uh, organizational design people, which would be more appropriate if you, you know, if it was the other way around. But you have two mature companies. Uh, and so a high degree of autonomy is, I think, completely appropriate here. Uh, and would probably be quite value destroying if, if uh, Sani or PM tried to export lots of managers across the line. You, you would, autonomy would drop, performance would drop, it would be a mess. That's uh, so. I mean, I think it. I think it follows from intuition, from practical business sense. But those are the sort of guides. So that is it. Um, these slides. Are, I've you know we've uh, kind of got some uh, some slides like Upsala, etc. Uh, and the recording. So I'll post those up onto a curator. And uh, and that is us. That is us done. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nick. It's been, I have it's been very interesting. So, other recordings have been posted, have they already? Yeah, I'm going to check with Greg and just note that uh, they were struggling with the downloads. So, we'll just make sure that they're up and downloadable. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Yep. So, any questions you have, obviously, feel free to email. And, um, uh, Nick, actually, I uh, got a question about assessment free. Yes. Um, because in the assessment free for the reasonable distribution of work time, for the number four, it says 500 words per question or analyze this. Right. So we've got six questions, which is already 3,000 words. And for the um, the second part, which is the executive summary, we need approximately 300 words and introduction is about 500. So all together, it is already over 3,500 yep. words. So how could we do that? I'm quite comfortable that uh, you're, you're, I think you could easily do a great job in 3,500 words. Uh, you know, so I, I'm not, <clears throat> there's no, uh, you know, it's, it's sort of a guideline to say it's a substantial bit of thought that, that is expected. You do not need to hit 3,900 words, I don't think. Um, and the word count is also including the <clears throat> reference, right? Uh, yeah, look, I, I mean, to the extent that I don't think references, but yes, the table contents, because I imagine some of this will be tables and diagrams. So a reasonable estimate. Okay, so not include the reference because- I'm quite happy that doesn't include references, reference. but please don't, yeah, no, it's not gonna be references, but I'm also not, if your document relies substantively on your annexures, then it should include the annexure word count. If the annexures are simply additional information, then, then it doesn't need to count. And, and what I'm saying there is, Guys, I, you know, I'm a practical person. I go, if your answer 
if I have to read the annexure in order to understand what you're writing, then it's got to be in your word count. Because I'm just trying to say, I don't want 30 pages of cut and paste from something. That, that's, not, that's not the goal here. But if you provide 100 pages of annexure that you just say, hey, I found this interesting stuff, but you don't need to read it and my answer is still contained, uh, then, then that's fine. But I would only provide, you know, if I need to go to your annexure to get you the marks, then it needs to fit inside the word count. So it means okay. we don't need to um, exactly use 500 words to answer one question, no. right? No, you can, uh, those were guidelines and I'm more than happy you shuffle them as you see fit. Oh, great. You just have another question. In your email attachment on the assignment question, there are five. But in the unique guide, there are six. The sixth one was a uh, prepare a market analysis, HR strategy, and supply chain matrix. It is not in your email five questions. I think in the email, I said that your board decides that you should proceed. Please provide recommendations. Okay, so that is the sixth uh, in that case. Okay, because it's just listed in the unique guide. It was not. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So I'm, I'm quite happy that you follow the email uh, guideline uh, if, if that works for everybody. Um, you know, and I, I, I'm i sure so, you know, many of you have a good amount of experience. And so um, I'm, uh, I, I believe I'll be able to understand your logic if you provide a reasonable report in whatever format you want to do it in. No, if we, we are aligned, with, uh, to follow your 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 email guideline, then we would go go for it. Yep, that, that look that works for me. I think it covers very neatly what's what, what's in the course. So yeah, excellent. Thanks very much, and uh, you know, thank you for the time you spent here. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Nicholas. Appreciate it. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you. Okay, wait. Uh, Greg, Greg just wants to chat. No, no. Um, <laughs> just with William and Subhashini. Okay, yeah. William and Sureshi. The rest of you, thanks very much. Have a great evening. Okay. Thank also, you. do we have Hello. the assessment as well? Bye. I'm sorry. The the uh, ass assessing this uh cost, this module. You're going to send out a link, right? Okay. Uh, great. Okay. Feedback survey, Leon. Is that what you're talking a about? Survey, yes. Oh, okay, yeah. perfect. Yep, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Bye. See you later. Cheers. Thanks, Nicholas. Thank you. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye. Have a good evening. Bye. Thanks, Bye. Nicholas. Thank you. Cheers.